Jelani, do you need to tell us about uh, sketching high dimensional data? All right, so today I'll talk more about more examples of linear sketching. And uh, also uh, dimensionality reduction. So, you know, Johnson Lennon Strauss, for example. So, you know, one of the early papers um, from the mid 90s in, in the area of sketching and streaming was this uh, paper by Alone, Montius, and Segeti. And it was LP norm estimation um, <clears throat> of a vector X being updated in a turnstile stream. So just remember that means if I say update I delta, that means that Xi gets incremented by delta, where delta could be positive or negative. <clears throat> and you know, one of their results was this AMS sketch, which said that um, we can estimate the L2 norm up to one plus epsilon with the probability at least one minus delta using O of one or epsilon squared log one over delta, words of memory. Okay. And, you know, how does that, let's, uh, let's see how to do that. So it's a linear sketch. Um, and their linear sketch was as follows. They said pi is this matrix where each entry is plus minus one over root M and you have M rows here and N columns. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna maintain Y which is pi X in memory. <clears throat> and then you're gonna estimate um, x squared by y squared. Okay. And I'm not going to do, I'm not going to go through the, you know, all the calculations. I'll just show you basically what goes into it. It's nothing too complicated. It's just, first of all, you show that the expectation of y squared is in fact correct. You can just write that down and verify. Um, as long as the plus minus one are two y's independent. Remember, we talked about ky's independent hash functions before. Okay. <clears throat> and also the variance of uh, y squared is O of one over M times the L2 norm of X to the fourth. And this is as long as the plus minus ones are four wise independent. Okay. <clears throat> and I don't want to spend time. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I want to tell you today. I don't want to spend time on uninteresting calculations, but you know, why does this come up? Well, you know, what is <clears throat> the variance of, of this random variable is just it depends on you know the second moment. So what is, what is y L2 norm squared? This is, of course, the sum of y i squared, which is the sum, let me call actually, let me call it the sum over r of y r squared. And this is um, 1 over m times the sum r goes from 1 to m times the sum i goes from 1 to n of, I'll say, sigma r i y, uh, or sorry, x i. Right? This is the L2 norm squared. So when I look at the second moment of this random variable, that means I'm raising it to the fourth power. 
equal to the fourth, then all of this gets squared. Right, so here I'm gonna start getting terms that look like, you know, sigma, uh, <clears throat> sigma R1, uh, I1, sigma R1, I2, sigma R2, I3, sigma R2, I4, right? So I'm gonna get some double sum, one over M squared, some stuff like this. And then when I when I look at the expectation of the second moment, you know, I'm basically going to have to deal with expectations of terms that look like this. And the point is, there are only ever four signs at a time that are involved. So as long as these signs are four wise independent, it determines the second moment, right? So I don't need full randomness in my in my matrix. Okay. But you know, <laughs> that's where that's where I, the bounded independence suffices. Okay. So <clears throat> once you have this, you, you just do Chebyshev's inequality, and then you can get um, success probability, you know, 99%. So all this stuff together implies with, you know, M being O of 1 over epsilon squared, you get, let's say, 90% success probability. So if you want success probability 1 minus delta, you repeat this structure log one over delta times, or O of log one over delta times, and you take the median result out of all of them, right? So it's going to be the median of many such estimators. And that gives you the space bound that I showed you. OK. Um, one optimization, time-wise, so let's say a faster algorithm using the same space. <clears throat> Is, is basically the count sketch by Chari Carr, oops, Chari Carr, Chen, and Farage Colton in O2. Uh, and then, you know, for, specifically for using it for L2 estimation, you can look at Thorup and Zhang in O4. So let's think about, you know, what is it, what are you actually doing? Um, in the stream, like what is your what are your streaming algorithm actually doing to update itself every time you see an update? So <clears throat> you're maintaining, you're supposed to be keeping track of this vector x subject to updates that look like you know xi gets to be xi plus delta. This is update i delta. Well, this is the same thing. This is the same thing as um, x gets x plus delta times the i standard basis vector. So we're maintaining pi x, right? So that means that pi x gets to be pi x plus delta times the ith column of pi. So pi is this pi is this you know short wide matrix, and every time there's an update, you're taking some column of pi scaling it, and then, you know, adding to the sketch. Now, in our previous, you know, the AMS sketch that I just showed you on the last whiteboard, pi was a dense random matrix, right? Every entry was plus minus one over root m. Um, it would be nice if pi were a sparse random matrix, right? Because it, let's say pi only has one non-zero entry, for example. Then it's very fast. To add any column, every, every column of pi only has one non-zero entry. Then it's very fast to update our sketch. We add we add the ith column of pi that that only has one non-zero. It only takes us constant time to do that, right? And in fact, you can do that. So the count sketch looks like this matrix, and we're going to see this matrix more today as well as tomorrow. Um, each column. You pick one uniformly random location, you make it be plus minus one, and the rest of the column is all zeros. So you can imagine you have two hash functions. Hash function one uh, maps for each column, it tells you where the non zero entry is. And then you have another hash column, an another hash function, which for each column, it tells you 
is the random sign there going to be a plus one or a minus one? Okay. So these two hash functions determine the matrix. OK. Um, and again, a claim that I'm not going to say for you. So the claim is that um, if y equals pi x for pi equals the count sketch, then I still have the same thing. The expectation of y L2 norm squared is x L2 norm squared. And the variance of this of this random variable um, <clears throat> is equal to O of 1 over m times L2, L2 to the fourth. OK. And again, you only need you know, four, four y's independence to make things work. So. This is basically the same performance as the AMS sketch in terms of memory, but you're getting runtime or update time, which is only constant um, instead of one over epsilon squared. Now, again, if you want to amplify the success probability to one minus delta, you'll repeat this log one over delta times. So now your update time will be log one over delta, but it'll only be log one over delta as opposed to log one over delta times epsilon squared, one over epsilon squared of the AMS sketch. So this is strictly faster. Um, now, after this, so this is strictly for this for the L2 norm specifically. What about other norms? What about other LP norms? So for um, 0 less than P less than or equal to 2, let's say less than 2, if P is less than 1, it's not a norm, but it's still a defined function of x. Uh, Indic showed that this uh, similar space bound as possible. Okay. And you know what was the idea there? So definition, a distribution D over R is P stable if for all uh, vectors x and rn, if say z1 up to zn are iid from this distribution, then if you look at the random variable, the sum of zi xi, this should be distributed like uh, basically another variable, variable distributed according to z scaled by the LP norm of x, where z is also distributed according to d. Okay. Can, can you all hear me well, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, examples. If P equals 2, then this is, for example, the Gaussian distribution, right? If you add independent Gaussians, you get a Gaussian and the variance is just add, right? The L2 norm would be like the standard deviation of the, of the resulting sum. And you know there is something right called the central limit theorem, which says if you add lots of copies, uh, you know independent copies of I, from some distribution, you should get something that eventually becomes a Gaussian. Uh, so like, why would you ever have a scale factor that's not the L two norm? And the answer is that you know the central limit theorem requires bounded variance, right? So if you were to have a p stable distribution for p not equal to two, then it would have to be that that. Um, this distribution D has unbounded variance. Otherwise, you would be violating the central limit theorem. And in fact, um, the theorem is that uh, these distributions do exist. If and only if uh, basically P is in the interval from 0 to 2. If P is bigger than 2, they don't exist. Um, OK. <clears throat> So good. Now, what is index algorithm? Oops, sorry. Okay, this seems to. Let's go here. Okay. Um, so, what is index algorithm? So his matrix pi looks like as follows. 
each one of these entries is distributed according to, uh, I'll call it ZR, let's, let's actually call it. ZRI is distributed according to this distribution D the, the, for the P for P. Okay, so the, the P stable, some P stable distribution. And again, he has M rows where it's going to turn out that M is going to be to, chosen to be something that's roughly one over epsilon squared times some constant. Okay. Now, how do you, you know, and what is his estimator? So you store Y, which is pi X, and you estimate the LP norm of X by, um, by the LP, by the median entry of Y divided by the median of the absolute value of DP. What do I mean by that? So if you plot DP, DP looks like this as follows, and it's some distribution, and then look at Look at a random variable, which is distributed in the following way. You sample from DP and you take its absolute value. Okay. Um, so then now you get some distribution that you know is, looks something like this. And I want to know what is the median of this distribution, meaning what's the value, some value such that if you look to the right and to the left of the value, basically of that value. The amount of probability mass here is exactly a half. So this, this is what I'm saying. I'm calling the median of the absolute value of the distribution. Okay. I mean, you can always scale. Let's scale the distribution so that this thing is, is one. So we can we can we can uh, ignore that from now on. Okay, so why is this? So that's it. That's the algorithm. Um, of course, there is an issue here in that you know these are real, real valued random variables. I have finite precision on my computer. Ultimately, ultimately, I'd like to say that I use you know bounded memory in bits. That can be handled just by rounding. Just you know round whenever you sample round these numbers to finite precision. You can do that calculation and it, it's all fine. Um, there's also the issue that, um, you know, these are, as I said it, all, all the entries in this matrix are IID. So this is a very big random matrix. Um, and, you know, I, it's expensive to store a big random matrix memory wise. With the AMS sketch, that wasn't an issue because the entries are only four wise independent. So I could generate the whole matrix using only a log n bit seed. But here, if I require independent entries, to get the P stability property, then it's not clear. Um, it's not clear then how to generate this with low memory, right? But we'll get to that. So how do you analyze this? So the way he analyzes this is as follows. <clears throat> now, what do we know? We know that the expectation. Okay, so first of all. Um, For all R, we know that um, kind of YR is distributed like basically DP times the LP norm of X. So let me just bring this divide, divide by the LP norm over here and get rid of that. So we know that each entry of Y, as if you scale down by the LP norm of X, is a P stable random variable, which implies that the expectation of, remember now, what did I say? The median of the absolute value of the distribution is, is one. I scaled it that way. In other words, the amount of probability mass in the distribution between minus one and one uh, is a half. Does this make sense? So I'm saying, look at the indicator function of an interval, the interval from minus one to one. Okay. What's the expectation of the indicator function? of the interval, it's the probability that the random variable lands in that interval. Okay. So the probability that it lands in that, the probability that YR lands in that interval is exactly a half because I scaled this stable distribution so that exactly half the mass lies between minus one and one. 
Okay. So, and the distribution, you know, I'm not going to justify this here, but believe me, it's true. The distribution does, you know, have some kind of bell shape like this. Okay. So, um, if you look at the expectation of, actually, let me do the following. If you look at the expectation of the sum, R goes from one to M, let me put a one over M here as well, of the indicator function of minus one, minus epsilon, one plus epsilon, evaluate at YR, okay? So what, is this, what does this thing mean? This means what, what fraction of the entries of Y do I expect? So we know, what do we know? We know that the amount of mass between minus one and one, the amount of mass here is a half, right? Now, if I tell you that this is what the distribution looks like, if I go out, if I now go out here to minus one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon, right? If I go out there, there's some additional mass now that I've gained, right? So first of all, by linear of expectation, this is the same thing as, you know, basically pushing the expectation inside to each one of these indicators, right? So we, we know what that is. So what is, what is, or let me ask you, what is the expectation of the indicator of minus one minus epsilon one plus epsilon evaluate at y r right so this thing is just basically uh, one over m times the sum r goes from one to m of this. What is this? I don't know. This is a question for you to make sure we're all on the same page here, or kind of roughly what is it? Oh, I guess people in the webinar can't talk, can they? Okay, <laughs> I forgot that this is. Uh, okay, well. Chat it. Someone send it in the chat. <laughs> I know it takes time to type things. But OK, so I guess when, when people can't talk, when they have to chat, it's not as uh, efficient. So, so the point is, look, like if the distribution really looks like this, then you know, previously the amount of mass in that black area was a half. I widened it a little bit by epsilon on each side. I gained, you know, some theta epsilon. So the point is that this thing is going to be a half plus some theta of epsilon. Okay. And similarly, if I look at the expectation of one over m, some R goes from one to m of the indicator of minus one plus epsilon, one minus epsilon evaluated at yr, this thing is a half minus theta epsilon. Right, that's basically if I, if I went if I went in a little bit. Right. So what is this saying? This is saying that in expectation, at least, you know, more than half the entries, more than half the entries are um, are under some threshold, and less than half the entries are. Um, smaller than some threshold, right? What am I happy? I'm happy, basically, I'm happy if the median, if the median actually in absolute value is somewhere in this like teal region, right? In between, uh, minus, or actually the teal region is all of this. Right. If the median, if the median is somewhere in there, then I'm happy. Right. Now, if I know that this is proof by picture, if I know that less than half, let, let's just focus on the on the kind of the positive numbers right now. Okay, let's look at the absolute value. If I know that less than half are in this red region or in this region, if I know that less than half are here 
and that more than half are here, it means that the median has to be somewhere in here, right? So I'm happy when this happens. I'm happy when, you know, if this, if this happens not only in expectation, but actually happens that a half plus theta fraction are in that interval, I'm happy. And if this also happens that a half minus theta epsilon fraction are in that interval, I'm also happy. So I'm happy when both of these two events happen. You know, remove the expectations. If it's actually true that one over m times the sum of these indicators is half plus theta epsilon, and one over m times the sum of these indicators is half minus theta epsilon from these two different intervals, I'm happy. Now, now I want to say that not only does it happen in expectation, but it happens with decent probability. And for that, I can get that from a turnoff bound. And not a turnoff, Chebyshev's inequality, right? Because I know that. The variance of 1 over m times the sum of whatever yr, if these are independent random variables, if the rows are independent, then this is um, 1 over m squared times the sum r goes from 1 to m of the variance of this indicator. Now, what is the variance of that indicator? I have no idea, but what I do know is that it's at most one because the indicator itself is always between zero and one. And that's enough. So this is at most one over m squared or one over m, sorry, because there are m, there are m things that I'm summing. One over m squared times m, which is one over m. So I know the variance is bounded by one over m. So if I pick m to be big enough, if I pick m to be some big constant times one over epsilon squared, Chebyshev tells me that with 90% probability, I will get this. And also with 90% probability, I'll get this as well. So by union bound with 80% probability, I'll have both the events that I want and the median will in fact be in the range that I want it to be in to guarantee a one plus epsilon approximation. Okay, so that's it, okay? It's basically just follows again by that by a second moment calculation and applying Chebyshev's inequality. OK, now if you inspect the proof, where did we use independence? OK, we used it in two places. I used independence right here to say that the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. And I also used independence you know, in these two places, you know, right here and also right here. Why? Because I said, you know, I wanted to calculate the expectation of the indicator function of an interval of this random variable yr, right? What is yr? I said yr is a p-stable random variable, and I know what a p-stable random I know what the p-stable distribution looks like, so I know how much mass is in some interval. How do I know that yr is a p-stable random variable? Because it's a sum of independent p-stable random variables, so I'm using independence there. Okay. So that's the second place I'm using independence. It's, it's to guarantee that yr is p-stable so that I can understand how much mass is in certain intervals, how much probability mass is in certain intervals. OK. So the first one is easy to fix. So I want to say that this variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variances. But as long as the random variables are at least two-wise independent, that's true. You don't need full independence for this to be true. You just need pairwise independence. So I can just make sure that the rows of the matrix are pairwise independent. I don't need full independence across the entire matrix. Now, what about the entries within a row? Now there, I don't need to actually have that, you know, it's not, it's not, cru it's not crucial for me that YR is p-stable. I just want the distribution of yr to be approximately p-stable. Okay, what what does approximately p-stable mean in this case? It means that the kind of the Kolmogorov distance between this distribution and an actual p-stable distribution is at most epsilon. And you know, if you don't, Kolmogorov distance just means look at the L infinity distance of the CDFs. I want it to be the case that for any interval, the amount of probability mass in that interval compared with an actual p-stable random variable are, are close to each other within an additive epsilon. Okay. And it turns out that, so I want to say that, you know, 
Um, if you look, you know, for all, let's say for all Q, if I look at the probability that an actual p-stable distribution is at most Q versus the probability that, you know, my sum, the sum of, um, let's say Y, Yi Xi is at most Q, where this thing has P norm one, and these things are only say KYs independent. I want that this thing to be at most, you know, epsilon, let's say. Right? If that's true, then I'm still happy because I, I still can do the proof that I just showed you. And in fact, this is true for K being O of one over epsilon to the P. And th this was shown by Daniel Kane, myself, and Woodruff in 2010. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's one way to de-randomize it optimally. Um, in his original paper, Indic had a different way to de-randomize de it, de-randomizing it using a uh, Nissan pseudorandom generator, which gave a good bound, but um, you did lose a little bit by doing that. Okay. So that's good. So any, any other, any questions before I move on? Okay, let's continue. So what about other norms? For example, LP for P bigger than two, okay? And the theorem there, and this is due to Bar Yosef, JRAM, Kumar and Shiva Kumar in O2 is that for P greater than two, you know, some constant approximation of LP in a stream requires um, Omega n to the one minus two over p bits of memory. Right. So you know if p is less than two, then this this doesn't really say anything. But once p is bigger than two, um, this is a polynomial. This is a polynomial lower bound, right? So if p is a, if p is three, approximating the L three norm requires n to the one cubed end of the one third, so and yeah, one end of the one third bits of memory. So there is no logarithmic space algorithm. There is no polylog space algorithm. Okay. And this is actually tight up to you know log factors. And there's been work on reducing the log factors, but um, you know, for example, Indic and Woodruff, I believe it's 05, maybe it's 06, said that um, well, sorry. They said that up to log factors, um, n to the one minus two over p is possible. There is an algorithm. There's a streaming algorithm that actually achieves that. And I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to show you the proofs of either of these. However, I will show you kind of why why the bound is n to the one minus two over p, and where or not the full y, but part of the y. Okay, so the lower bound. is via communication complexity. And it's a reduction from multi-party set disjointness. Okay, so, so what's going on there? So the setup is you have a bunch of players. So you have player one, player two, up to player T. Each one has a subset of one to N. So this person has S1, which is a subset of one to N. This person has S2, which is a subset of one to N. And this person has SN or ST, which is a subset of one to N. So they're promised that either 
for all i not equal to j si intersect sj is empty there are no pairwise intersections or <coughs> basically um, they do intersect so And I think it's even stronger than that. You're even you're in pro, uh, I think you're even promised that all the pairwise intersections are are exactly the same. Okay. okay. So oh, and also I also say that the model that's considered here is um, there's public randomness. So there's a public random string in the sky. Every, all the players can see this randomness. So when a player decides what to send as a message, it gets to look at its input, any message that it got, and the public random string in the sky in order to decide what to send to the next player. And we're going to look at one-way communication here where player one first sends a message to player two, who then sends a message to player three, who then sends a message to player four, et cetera. And eventually, this person has to say, one or two. You have to decide which case they're in. Okay. So that's the model of computation. That's the model of communication that we are studying here. Right. And this public random stream in the sky is basically, you know, you can say a coordination mechanism. Right. It helps them that they all have this common reference string that they can refer to and give them some source of entropy. And they only have to succeed with, say, constant probability. Um, you know, wants to succeed. with probability at least, say, 90%. Yeah. And the theorem is that um, the total number of bits communicated to solve this problem is omega n over t, where t is the number of players, remember. And since they're exactly, you know, t minus one messages that are sent, right? This implies, first of all, that um, some message length is omega n over t squared, right? So that's the that's the communication theorem that you know uh, Baryosov et al. proved in their paper is that. One of the at least one of the players has to send a message of length at least n over t squared bits. Yeah. Oh, John, you look like you're uh, troubled. Yeah, I'm a bit. This is a bit counterintuitive to me. Why this uh, complexity actually shrinks in t? Why the complexity shrinks in t? Yeah. Ah. Um. So actually, this is. Let me. Uh, So you can think about it this way. So first of all, like let's, you know, if you think about all these sets having the same size, okay, then um, kind of all of them, you know, the hard case, the hard case actually is basically where all the sets have size roughly n over 4t, or you know, theta n over t. I mean, there are t players, the universe is of size n. You know, if they have to be disjoint, that means that. You know, none of this, the average set size had better be less than n over t, right? Or at most n over t. So you think all the set sizes are at most n over t. So when there are more players, the sets are getting sparser. And then I think there, there is a protocol, there is a randomized protocol that basically achieves this. So what does it do? Um, uh, let me just think for a second. So I think it's something like um, each player. So let's say each player has a set of size n over t, right? I think what you do is like each player picks a 1 over t fraction of its elements at random. 
So that's n over t squared elements. And then it sends, the, it sends those elements to the next player. And the next player can detect whether or not there's, a, there's any kind of intersection, whether any of those elements are in his set as well. OK. Now, um, if there is an intersection, you caught it with probability. If there is something in the intersection, you caught it with probability 1 over t. Right? So, and now you have t, you have t chances to run this experiment because you have t players, right? So the probability that you fail kind of all t times to catch something in the intersection is like one minus one over t to the t, which is a constant. So you have a constant success probability running this experiment. And each player is sending roughly n over t squared bits. Well, it's n over t squared log n up to a log factor. It's achieving, it's achieving this lower bound that I just said. Does that make sense? OK. All right, good. So why does this theorem imply the lower bound for, for uh, LP moment, norm estimation? Um, so the claim now is that estimating, let's say, the LP norm up to, say, 1.1 requires omega n to the 1 minus 2 over p memory. Okay. And why is that? So case one is that for all i and i equals j. OK, so first of all, yeah, so what, so, okay, so what, is, what, are, the, what are the players going to do before I get here? What are the players going to do? So, I need, to I need to use the existence of a streaming protocol to, de to devise a communication protocol, or the existence of a streaming algorithm to devise a communication protocol. So these are the players. Now there's some streaming algorithm A. So I'll run, we'll run A on the stream you know, containing all elements of S1, then all elements of S2, et cetera, right? So P1, and it could be a randomized, it could be a randomized um, streaming algorithm as well. Okay. So P1 runs A on, on his part of the stream, which is S1. Then he sends the memory of A to P2 as a message. Now P2 can continue running the streaming algorithm on S2, then send the memory as a message, et cetera. Right? So if, if PT can then, you know, get a good answer based on, you know, if P2 can get a, you know, a good uh, answer with good probability based on the existence of the streaming algorithm, that, impl that will imply that the memory of the algorithm has to be omega n over t squared. And then we're going to end up setting uh, t, sorry, we're going to end up setting t to be n to the uh, 1 over p. Okay, so. So why does this setting of t, where does this setting of t come from? So case one is that for all um, i not equal to j, si intersect sj is the empty set, right? Then what do I know? I know that the vector x is basically, you know, a zero one vector, right? Because no, no item appears twice. So all, all frequencies in X, all entries in X are either zero or one. So that implies that the LP norm of X is at most, um, let's say the LP to the P is at most N, right? Case two is that, let's say there exists some I in the intersection of all of them. That implies that the LP norm to the P is at least T to the P. So in fact, let me, let me make T be 2N to the 1 over P. 
right? So now there's a gap, a constant factor gap between the LP norms in the two cases. So if I can approximate the LP norm to a constant factor, I can tell. So that's it. So uh, I'll set, you know, and I'll set T as above. So let's say, um, This is greater than, let's say, 2n if t is as above. Okay. So that's it. Okay. So, any questions before I move on? Okay. Um, so, there has, there has been work on you know, estimating other norms as well. Um, Maybe one of the ones I'll mention is uh, not just LP norms. Uh, you know, there was a paper in 2017. This is by Yaroslav Boshek, uh, Braverman, Chestnut, uh, Krauth, Gamer, and Yang. Um, that you know gives you know, uh, the exact complexity, space complexity required, you know, up to log factors for any symmetric norm. So, what is a symmetric norm? It means that um, you know, the norm doesn't change if you, you know, if you sit, if you, if you, um, change the sign of any entry or if you permute the coordinates. Okay. So any norm that has these two properties, um, you know, for example, LP norms are symmetric norms, right? They don't depend on the, the order of the coordinates and they also don't depend on the signs. Um, if you have a norm that satisfies these two conditions, they kind of give one meta theorem that tells you, that tells you the, the, sp the ultimate space complexity of estimating that norm in the data, st the data stream. Okay. Um, so I think that's all I wanna say about streaming norms. I think in the last 10 minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about dimensionality reduction. Actually, you know, I think what I'll do is um, rather than do, I'll do dimensionality reduction tomorrow, I think, because I have 10 minutes left. And what I'll do is I'll use these last 10 minutes to talk about another problem that's solvable with linear sketching, namely the heavy hitters problem. So let's, let me give myself more pages. Okay. Okay, so you know, we see items in a stream, e.g., you know, uh, query words to a search engine. And we want to know the frequent words. For example, the top K. Tell me what are the top K things that, you know, people, what are the top 100 things that people have been searching for today? Okay. Um, now, you can imagine doing this also in the, uh, sorry, I don't know why it keeps changing me to eraser, but anyway, you can imagine doing this in the turnstile, you know, it doesn't have to be in the turnstile model. You could imagine the model where you just see items and you don't delete items, right? I mean, that's a very natural model. Um, you could also imagine wanting to do it in a turnstile model with deletions. If, for example, I want to know big differences in changes in, in you know in frequency. So, you know, there, there's there's the frequency of words being searched for yesterday versus today, and I want to know what are the items that had a big change in frequency. 
So if I treat all of yesterday as, as plus updates to the XIs and today as minus updates, then XI will be the difference in the number of times I searched for, for I between today and yesterday. Again, imagining again, there's this high dimensional vector X where X is being indexed by words in the dictionary, right? So every time I see word I, it's like I'm adding one to XI. I saw, you know, X is a histogram of how many times I saw each word. Okay. So it turns out bad news. Um, kind of exact top K is impossible in little o of n memory. And you already know the answer to this. Why is this the case? So I know, again, people have to, there's no shared video. So um, so I see Arnold Filzer had a question, perhaps the, so maybe that's from before. But does anyone have a, a, a guess as to like why, why exact top K is, um, Why exact top K is impossible in some linear memory? And Ravi, I saw your question about, yeah, so top one, so top one, it's not, well, okay, so it's related to the infinity norm. It's not, it's not the infinity norm because I'm not outputting a norm, right? I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you the identity of the item that appears most frequently. I'm not telling you how many times he appeared. Um, but actually, good. So actually, if I, if I did have to tell you how many times he appeared, yeah. So let's just, let's just stick with that. Then, it, then I am telling you the infinity norm, right? And I know that um, estimating the LP norm takes memory n to the one minus two over p. So if p is infinity, then estimating the LP norm takes, you know, the infinity, estimating the infinity norm takes n bits of, of memory, right? This is exactly the lower bound that came from disjointness, right? If I had, if I had an algorithm that could tell me the top one, where k is one element in the stream. And its frequency, let's say, I could use that to solve disjointness. Okay. So, any questions about that? Okay. So, um, I could try to relax this definition. And one way to relax it is to do the following. So, I'll say an item is frequent. Or I'll call it, um, you know, let me call it KP frequent. K comma P frequent. If, if you look at X side to the P, it's bigger than a one over K fraction of the sum over all j of xj to the p. And in fact, there's something a little bit, I'm gonna, you know, there's, there's a, another definition I'm gonna give instead right now. So th this is an okay definition, but there's a, there's a stronger definition and str I say stronger for a specific reason I'll get into, but instead what I'll do is I'll say xi to the p is bigger than one over k times the sum j goes from k plus one to n of x star j to the p. Okay. So what does this mean? x star is the vector you obtain by sorting the entries of x and decreasing order by magnitude. So x one star, you know, x one star is the largest entry in magnitude of x. X two star is the second largest entry, etc. So you know, if x if x is the vector 0, 1, minus 7 to you know, minus 4, then x star would be the vector uh, minus 7, minus 4, 2, 1, 0, where basically I just sort, I just sort in decreasing order by magnitude. Okay. So what I'm saying is um, x i to the p is bigger than a 1 over k fraction of the, of the pth moment of the vector restricted to the tail, restricted to everything except for the top K. Okay. And can show K 
KP frequent basically becomes top K as P gets large. Okay, you can show this. I'm not going to show it, but this is some exercise that this is some kind of relaxation. This is some kind of relaxation of the notion of top K. Um, a smooth relaxation, you know, as P gets bigger and bigger. Okay. So really, you know, if I want, if what I actually want to solve is top K, then I, you know, if, since I can't solve top K, because unfortunately disjointness shows me that I can't, there's a, there's a lower bound. I could try to solve this, you know, KP frequent problem for as large a P as possible. Okay. And the larger the P I can get, kind of the better of an, of an approximation it is to the true top K problem. And then unfortunately it follows from, again, the same disjointness argument that P greater than two implies, you know, KP frequent requires at least poly n space. So kind of the best relaxation of top K that I can hope to solve in low memory is P equals two. And in fact, this is achievable in K log N memory via the count sketch, right? The count sketch is that same data structure I talked about earlier for L2 estimation in data streams, which gave a faster update time than the AMS sketch because it was very sparse. Remember this, this matrix that only had one, one non-zero entry per column, okay? So basically what does pi look like? So I'm gonna store pi x in memory. And then there's gonna be a query algorithm that based on pi x lets me recover the, the k for the frequent items, the items that are k2 frequent. So each entry in pi, I mean, so each column of pi has a plus minus one in a random location and zeros everywhere else. And the columns are independent of each other, at least pairwise, you know, have some amount of independence between them. So this is the count sketch matrix. But remember, like when with L2 estimation, I actually repeated this log one, you know, log whatever delta times and took a median. Here I'm also going to do something similar. I'm going to repeat this basic data structure. And I can imagine that there are actually many matrices that I'm stacking on top of each other. And each one in each column, you know, I pick a random location, make it plus minus one. Okay. So this is the count sketch matrix or drawing it a different way. You know, here I can imagine, let's say that this is, this has um, some, let's call it B, B entries per, per block. And the number of blocks is gonna, let's call it R, capital R blocks. So the total number of counters or rows is equal to, you know, let's say M, which is B times R, right? That's kind of the total memory. I need to maintain B times R counters. So let's draw those counters like this. Okay. And I'm going to have a hash function. You can imagine I have a hash function H1 h2 hr where each hash function maps me to a random entry in that row and then i also have kind of another hash function that gives me random signs and then i also have you know sigma 1 sigma 2 etc that gives me a random sign okay and 
you know, just thinking about what does it mean that I'm storing pi x in memory, right? When someone, you know, when I see something in the stream, when I see xi gets to xi plus delta, what do I do? Now, in each, in each one of the rows of this grid of counters, which are a row here correspond, corresponds, right? A row in that picture corresponds to a block of counters in this picture. It corresponds to a chunk of rows here. That's kind of one row of the next slide, right? This is row one, this is row two, up to like row R, right? So going back here, right? If you just turn that sideways, the top row is the first block, the next row is the next block, et cetera. So in each block in the matrix, there's exactly one non-zero entry. That's, that's telling me where I got hashed to. And the random sign there is either plus or minus one telling me you know, does this delta get pre-multiplied by plus one or minus one? So when I see an update that looks like this, that means that for each for each row here, I'm going to add or subtract delta to one entry at random. Right. So that's kind of how that's what it means really to me for me to process that update in my memory. I'm adding and subtracting delta to these rows. Now. Suppose I just wanted to know what is xi. I don't want to know the heavy hitters, let's say. I don't want to know the frequent items. I just want to know what is xi. So let's look at this value. The, or, you know, that was a plus. We could also look at this value. This one was a minus. So what's in that counter? At the end of the stream, or at query time, that counter will have minus xi, right? Because it has, it has all the updates to i, but with a minus sign out front. So at query time, that value in that, in that counter will be minus xi plus a sum over all j not equal to i, such that if you apply you know, the hash function, let's, let's say that this is row, this is row r, or no, row, row t, let's say, row t. If you, ht of j is the same as ht of i times the random sign associated with j times xj. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what's going to be in that counter. All the mass from i with, with i's random sign, together with all the weight from all the other people who collide under the hash function with their random signs as, as well. Okay. This is the same thing as saying. Um, right, so this is this is basically just sigma t of i xi plus the sum j not equal to i times an indicator of the event that ht of j equals ht of i times sigma t of j xj. So a natural thing to a natural way to estimate xi, we can estimate xi as you know sigma t i times that counter, which is equal to xi plus the sum over j and i equal to i, the indicator of that event, sigma t i, sigma t j, xj. And this you know, is the noise, which has expectation 0 because of the random signs. Okay. And <clears throat> um, it has expectation zero, but what can we say about like the prob? You know, what's the probability that it's large? So remember the noise I said, and I'm almost done. I am almost out of time. The noise is, I said, the sum of j not equal to i of the indicator of the event that h t i equals h t j sigma t i sigma t j x j right. So what's the probability that the noise let's say bigger than lambda by Chebyshev, this is at most one over lambda squared times the expectation of that sum squared, right? And, you know, first of all, the expectation of this thing is one over B, right? Um, so, <clears throat> I'm going to end up setting B to be something like some large constant times K if I want to solve approximate top K. And 
if you do this correctly, you can show that this is at most one over lambda squared times one over B times, you know, big O of something like X L2 to the fourth or something like that. You get some bound. Okay. Um, so if I set, so if lambda is something like, uh, Actually, maybe it's one over k d squared. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, if you set lambda to be something like you know, um, one over root k times the L2 norm of X. So this, this should be squared. Yeah. Um, then this thing here, you can prove will be like kind of at most, you know, one over 10 or something like that. Okay. So you can get that basically, the noise is bounded with good probability where this is the bound. Which means that if the item is very frequent, if the item's frequency is much bigger than this thing I circled, then you'll get a decent approximation to the item's frequency. Okay. And then now, how do I how do I turn that into, you know, an algorithm to find the frequent items? Well, first of all, I'm succeeding here with 90% probability, but I don't just have one counter, I have lots of them. I have capital R counters, right? Capital R is the number of times I repeated this experiment. So if I take the median of many such copies, the median of log n copies by a turnoff bound, it'll be a good approximation with failure probability at most one over poly n, which means by a union bound, I can get a good approximation to all the indices in x. So now that I have a good approximation to all the indices in x, I can basically do a for loop for i equals one to n, you know, get estimate xi tilde of xi. And then what I'll do is output the, let's say, 5k elements that had the top estimates. Okay. And I'm not going to go through the, you know, justifying why that works, but you can prove that this in fact works. You can prove that if you just do the estimation procedure I showed you and then look at the, you know, over all n elements, what are the elements that have the top, the top estimates? Then that will that's guaranteed to contain anyone who's frequent, anyone who's k two k comma two frequent, according to the definition of k comma two frequent that I showed you earlier. Okay. So I think I'm over a little bit over time. So um, any final questions before we before we break? So I see Ravi has a question about the L one L two norm. That's great. Um, you mean like take the L1 of the L2? Yeah, take, yeah, you frequently see it. Yeah, you could start take and any in general and, you know, so, start with the difference of norms. I mean, if I take just the plane, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure, whatever. I, I, just, I just wanna make sure I understand. So you're saying like, you know, take the first few entries, take the L1 number of that, take the next few, take the L1 number of that. And then now take the L2 of all those numbers. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. So, so that th there has been work on that as well. Um, so if you look, there's a paper that was by JRAM and Woodruff. I want to say maybe 09. And I don't remember the exact title of the paper, but it, somewhere in the title, it says cascaded, cascaded norms. That's what they call this. Right. And they give, they, they do give bounds on sketching for cascaded norms. So that has, that is something that has been studied. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the reference. Uh, okay, no you. problem. And then I see there's another question about the lower bound for top K. Okay, so um, basically, if, if you do have to get the, you know, an item as well as its, if, as well as an approximation to its frequency, then you know, that follows from um, the disjointness lower bound. So the point is, right? So the, the point with disjointness is that um, you know, there's, there's, 
there's one item whose value is, is t, his frequency is t, so his contribution to the pth moment is t to the p, right? Whereas you know, you know that the entire tth moment, the entire pth moment is at most kind of n plus t to the p. Oh, uh, John, you're, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I thought here you want to estimate which element is in the top k, not, not get the frequency of the top k. Yeah, but I think you could, um, so for the, yeah, so I, I mean, I think that's also fine because what you could do is like, you know, there are T players in this disjointness problem, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's one, if, it, if, it, if it's not disjoint, there's one guy who every single player has in his set. Right. So you could do something like, you know, use the first half of the guys will just try to identify who he is, right? Okay. Does that make sense? You mean which element it is? Yeah, the first half of the guys will run the streaming algorithm and the streaming algorithm will give the name of that element. If, he, if, if there is an element that, if it's not the disjoint case, if it's actually something in the intersection, that means that item will be heavy. He will be p-frequent, right? Okay. So the streaming algorithm will tell you his name. And then now they just want to verify that, you know, maybe they want to verify that he actually is in the intersection. So that mid player, that t over twoth player, will just say the name to the next player. That's just log n bits. And he'll say, hey, do you actually have this in your set? And if he does, then you know that you're not disjoint. So you've solved disjointness. Right? So yeah, so you do get the, the lower bound from disjointness does carry over, even if you only need to identify the name of the item. Um, Samson had a question. Is there a sparse version for faster update time for LP norm estimation? Um, there is a, there is there is a, an algorithm that gives faster like instead of one over epsilon squared time for LP norm estimation it gets like you know poly log one over epsilon time. Um, that's a paper that is by uh, Kane, Nels, uh, me, Ellie Porat, and Woodruff in um, 2011. So that, that gives a kind of a fast optimal space algorithm for LP norm estimation for P less than two with faster update time. Any other, any other questions? Are there additional questions? Okay, uh, then we... Thank uh, Jelani again for his talk, and uh, I'll come back tomorrow morning. We're done for today. I'll see you tomorrow.